the time. I think part of the reason I got signed was because I had long brown hair. Yeah. Like James Bay. Yeah. And I was <laughs> a little weird looking like Ed Sheeran. Yeah. And I was playing the gu- acoustic guitar like George Ezra. You know, you were those... James Sheeran Ezra. I was James Sheeran Ezra. Uh, <laughs> and, uh... I saw this thing you, you said um, uh, at one of your shows the other night that was you used to buy your own tickets to shows in Toronto so they would be sold out. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't remember the venue we're playing. I might have been Mass- Massey Hall. Yeah. And uh, I think we'd sold like 900 out of 1,000 or something like that. Or maybe it was like 960 out of 1,000. And I went and I used my mom's privilege here. But I used my mom's credit card to uh, <laughs> to buy the last like 20 tickets or whatever. And I remember like being like, my show is sold out. And like forgetting that I actually had just sold my own show oh, out. Yeah. <laughs> the disconnect happened yeah, right away. Yeah, but I was able to like compartmentalize stuff. Like this is so cool. I can't believe this many people are. And but then I, my, my mom like texted me like a month later she's like i have a charge for 500 dollars on my car like what is that i'm like i don't know what you're talking about and then i looked at it, i'm like oh it's because I, I sold my own show out it's 500 bucks canadian though it's like it's like 150 exactly don't, don't worry it's great it's great that's all right don't, don't worry all about it well that must be meaningful to be doing i mean how many you're doing three nights at scotia bank here in toronto three nights yeah which is crazy you that, know yeah it's meaningful to you i bet yeah just walking around and seeing like the drake insignia all over the place like this is like his it seems like he has his his fingerprints all over that venue and it's like wow i'm playing where drake plays that's pretty cool and um you know just like a moment when you're like watching the raptors on tv and then remembering that you're selling shows out at that venue it's pretty cool yeah it's 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 a beautiful thing i want to talk a little bit about um uh, a little bit about sort of expectations versus reality when it comes to your career because what i what i find really interesting about you is before this moment, before this record blew up, you you had already been signed. You got signed to a deal when you were like how old? I was eighteen when I got signed. And I think like there's a feeling that even you had that like that's going to be the world changer. Okay, I signed my name to a record deal. I got. I'm going to be. I'm going to. I'm going to tour the world. It's all going to be. It's all going to be huge. I'm never going to be here again. I'm going to be on a tour bus and in a plane with Prince for the rest of my yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk to me a little bit about the expectation versus the reality? Yeah. I mean, I came from a place where, like, I had absolutely no connection to the music industry. Like, I had no idea what it was like besides what I would see in movies. And, like, I, I, I truly was basing my uh, idea of the music industry off of the movie The Rocker, which was, like, this terrible <laughs> movie with Teddy Geiger and... Dwight Schrute from the yeah, office. Dwight from the office was in it. Right? I actually think that so- the songs in that movie are great. Mm-hmm. I thought Teddy did a great job writing the songs. But like I, I, uh, I watched the movie. I'm like, oh, that's what it's like. Like you meet the record label guy. There's like the montage of like the fame and fortune, and then I get addicted to heroin, and it's all over. <laughs> yeah, right, but uh, right. or that's not what happens in the movie. But that's, that's kind of like what you were like. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh shit. Like at some point, I'm going to start doing hard drugs. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, but uh, you know, so I didn't have any idea what the music industry was like, really, and I. I had always wanted to be a musician, but I was kind of lazy with like my my dreams kind of didn't extend beyond like, you know, getting signed. And so I got signed when I was in high school. How? Um, I was just putting music on SoundCloud and uh, it was starting to kind of get, gain some traction like locally. Like you would hear someone like driving by listening to the song and, yeah. or they'd play it before like the volleyball game or whatever. Um, so uh, I was getting some like local traction and like, starting to make something of a name for myself, like in like the open mic and like local scene. I was playing like the gelato shop. Wow. Uh, I was playing like that Dartmouth College's like spring festival. I was playing like the first artist at like 1.30 p.m. Like, right. you know, so um, the song got found on SoundCloud by like a pretty, you know, well in tuned A&R or public because like the song was not blowing up at all by any metric. But uh, he found it and then connected me with the manager. Um, and, you know, the manager came to, New Hampshire, where I was living at the time, met my parents, and that was kind of it. You know, he took me to L.A., I recorded a few songs, and Republic Records signed me, like, you know, after, like, a showcase there. Um, And so, yeah, I I got in the music industry and, like, was immediately like, oh, my God, there's no, like, private jet picking me up. Uh, I'm taking the the bus down in New York. I'm, I'm, like, staying in the cheapest place possible. Um, And... uh, it was just a moment of like, okay, this isn't like a dream. It's a dream, but it's not the dream I thought it was. Um, and it took me a few years to wrap my head around that. Um, and I think like that was a hard transition for me being like, I'm going to follow my dream then having to explain to people like why they still hadn't heard my music yet or I hadn't put anything out or I wasn't touring. And, uh, you know, 
it was just an expectation versus reality moment. It, it must have been. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Like it must have been a little embarrassing. Like because pro- people yeah. people were probably like, oh no no it really he really did it. Like oh they I heard that guy who's playing the gelato shop got signed. And, and all of a sudden you're home, like, you know? Yeah, there's no, like, Instagram wasn't at the point where, like, you would take a photo of you signing a record deal at that point. So basically yeah. I was just telling everyone that I got signed, yeah. and they're like, uh-huh, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure, sure. You're living at your dad's, right? <laughs> um, so I was like, yeah, I got signed, and I think my, re- I mean, I don't want to go into the specifics of my record deal, but please, it certainly please. was not <laughs> yeah. a lucrative deal. Yeah. Um, so the money wasn't, like, anything, really, that was going to change my life more than, like, a minimum wage job would. Um, and yeah, it was a little bit like, it was a little bit embarrassing because I think I wanted to prove to people that it was like real. And like, I'm, I don't think I ever pulled up my e uh, docu sign record late record deal, but I was like, no, like, trust me that this guy's really in the industry. It kind of was a lot of me having to convince people that it was happening. Yeah. That he was even real at all. Yeah. And then like, you know, you go to, and I went to Nashville, uh, about, a year after I got signed, maybe six months after I got signed, to kind of like feel like I was in the music industry somehow. And down there, I felt like I was even less in the music industry. Yeah. Everyone's signed down there. No yeah. one gives a shit. Yeah. Uh, so I was in Nashville just like writing songs every day with people that were like already skeptical of a white guy with an acoustic guitar walking into the room. You know, there was a lot of that at the time. I think part of the reason I got signed was because I had long brown hair. Yeah. Like James Bay. Yeah. And I was a little weird looking like Ed Sheeran. Yeah. And I was playing the gu- acoustic guitar like George Ezra. You know, you, those... were, you were James Sheeran Ezra. I was James Sheer Ezra. Uh. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I was really just like a symptom of like that time, like that 2010s, like indie folk songwriter stuff, which yeah. is, I still love, obviously. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of my show. But uh, I, I don't think I was signed because I was like a Billie Eilish type, like next generation talent. Um, right. So... I feel like I was, I looking back, the way I was signed wasn't like this huge dream come true. It was kind of like, I felt like I was, I was kind of like a, like, yeah, like a symptom of a, of, a, of a genre and a feeling at the time. And, and I had to really like prove myself in those early days in sessions in Nashville and like to show people that I was worth their time and that I wasn't just like another like, you know, artist getting cycled into the machine and thrown away. What, what I like about that is that it's, that's really how it goes for everybody. For mm-hmm. like, for almost everybody, for 99.99999% of people that we know who have been signed to record deals. Yeah. That, that's kind of it. That, that really is, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's nice to hear you talk about it um, in, in a way that says like, hey, this wasn't overnight for me. I had a really weird, hard time at the beginning. Was there an, because a lot of what I want to talk to you about today is sort of this idea of like, Hey, I, 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 the music I was writing before it wasn't really authentic to me, and now the music I write is authentic to my life, and it's working out really well. Is was there like an aha moment where you're like, I got to write some songs that are a bit more true, or is that just like a helpful press framing device? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Like, I don't think there was one moment where I was like, this isn't making me happy anymore. I need to go to the mountains, you know, like. <laughs> 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 it wasn't like it wasn't as like cliche or as like stereotypical as that. It was, <clears throat> and you know the music I made my first two albums, I did like a lot at the time when I made them, and they did mean a lot to me then. Um, I think it's just that I, the half life for that feeling was really short. Like I would make the music and then like, two or three months later I'd be like, man, I don't care about that anymore. And then like with the second record, it was even shorter. It was like by the time the album had come out, I was completely done with it. I was actually writing Stick Season when I, the album was was coming out. Um, I was just kind of tired of um, of the process more than I was the result. Like, I feel like the songs I put out, I, do, I did care about. It's just the way that I got to them was becoming so much harder. Like, you know, I was going to sessions in New York where I was living at the time, like, simply because I had roommates that were, like, working 9 to 5s, and I wanted to, like, work a 9 to 5 myself in the music industry. Right. Because I always felt like this isn't a real job. Yeah. I make my own schedule. I'm terribly unstructured in my yeah. in my brain and my life. And, like, yeah. I need to, like, wake up in the morning and go to the studio. That's, like, a, that's a romantic thing that a lot of songwriters talk about. Like, right. I think they read that Rivers Cuomo article where he, from Weezer where he mm. was, like, I approach it like a job. I, you know, I take a lunch break in the middle of the day. Yeah. Like, yeah, I get it, you know? Totally. And it's really hard to do that, but it's also hard to not do that because otherwise, like... You watch NBA slam dunk compilations for two hours, <laughs> like go eat food, go on your phone, make something for 10 minutes that might change your life and then yeah. like play FIFA. And it's like, dude, like that can work. Like, and that has worked for me, but I don't like that it works because it, it makes me feel like I don't have, I'm not valuing half of my day. Like 
you know, like sidebar here, but like Stick Season I wrote in like 25 minutes after a session, like, and the song has completely changed everything about my life, like fundamentally. Can we, can we listen to a little bit of it? Once Are you tired of it? Forever, now you still can't call me back and I love her mom, but it's the season of the sticks and I saw your mom, she forgot that I existed and it's half my fault, but I just like to play the victim, I'll drink alcohol till my friends come home for Christmas and I'll dream each night. I got good goosebumps, I love that song. I love this song too, man. Like, I still love it. I love how much joy it brings people when they hear it. I love, um that I still feel like I still feel the same emotion in that song that I did when I wrote it. Um, and I, I just love it. And like, I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so like aware of like the massive privilege it is to have one song that can like really catapult your career. Yeah. Um, can, can you go back to what you were saying that you like, with yeah. the, cause um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with the where and when of people who write the song mm-hmm. where that comes. I talked to um, name drop you, but I talked to Brandon Flowers one time oh, cool. from The Killers. And he told me this story about I asked him about the same kind of I was having the same kind of conversation. They were like struggling. They were like a, a band in Vegas, whatever, yeah. you know. And he said he was in his sister's daughter's childhood bed. Wow. Because he had nowhere else to go. Yeah. And he was just kind of looking at the world around him and he felt like there's nowhere to feel more depressed than like in your sister's your yeah. sister has a life, and you're in the daughter's And even the daughter has a life. Yeah. Even she's, like, out, and, and you're he, just, like, chilling. And he wrote Mr. Brightside. That's crazy. So what's yours? Yeah. Um, that is way cooler than mine. <laughs> I got to make some shit up. I'm on top of a roller coaster. <laughs> uh, I, was in, I was in Mount Everest, actually, when I wrote that song. A lot of people uh, don't know that, but actually, I was, yeah, I was. I didn't I was, even have any jacket on. I was yeah. up there, T-shirt and did, shorts. Didn't even have a guitar. I just, it just came to me. Yeah, you know? like, I, you, the guitar sounds you hear actually me with my mouth. <laughs> uh, no, I was, my story, I think, I think the story of this song is, like, emblematic of, like, why the record was important to me and it was like a good like microcosm for like a larger issue in my life at that time look at all those big words i just said uh um, it i was recording my second album i was i am and uh and i was working with joel little who's incredible by the way and like did an amazing job on that record and i whenever i talk about this record i try to be really sure not to like sound like i'm you know negating his yeah. talent and his effort because yeah. it means the world that we did that together and i still love a lot of the songs um but we were working on it. He was in New Zealand, and I was working from his studio in L.A., like remote engineer Mark Rankin in there, and we were like on the Zoom every day. And, and I was just burnt out, and I would, so I would go back to the Airbnb I was staying in. And it was an Airbnb that was like in the middle of um, – like the, the, the window looked out into like the courtyard of like a ring of the of the apartment building. So yeah. like you couldn't really see much. And it was kind of depressing. And um, I would go back to the Airbnb, and I would just like get high and like make music that I would never show anybody else because – I wanted to like enjoy making music for one hour of the day because I like the other eight hours I was just like slogging through it felt like, um, and I had like was writing a bunch of songs that night and I was like I want to put one of these on TikTok like I just want to like put something up on the internet and like stay relevant for a second here, um, and uh, I wrote the first verse to Stick Season and I was thinking about how I had to buy weed from high school kids as like a 23 year old guy and i was like i have to like the only way i can i'm like alone at home and i'm like buying weed from this like 18 year old kid and like you know i have to go to like <laughs> drive into like the pizza parlor in town and i just felt like a loot like, yeah. like i felt like a like a washed up guy in my career yeah and then i was at home and i felt like a washed up dude and like in my life yeah even though it had like at that point like hundreds of millions of streams and i've yeah. toured for a long time it's just like I just still felt like, I think I felt so disconnected from the music that to me, I felt like I didn't even have a job. Yeah. Uh, and so I started writing about that and like, I posted on TikTok and like, you know, I was going to bed and I was doing that thing where you're like refreshing to see if it's like doing well. Um, and it wasn't like no one was commenting on it or whatever. And I was like, man, do I just delete this shit? Like I'm such a, I'm so like, I succumb to like the social media success of something really easily. And yeah. 
uh, which is like one of my least favorite qualities about yeah, myself. It's the worst. Uh, no, sorry, it's not. I don't mean it's the worst quality you're of yourself. The worst, I mean, yeah, yeah. Ooh, narcissist. When you were loser. on the way in, someone said if you could mirror his internal dialogue to him, that'd be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's helping, and you're nailing it. Even the voice. Um, not great. No, not great. but I know what you're saying. Yeah. It is like it's, it's something that I, I, we I, all sir, fall into. I am. I am agreeing with you because it's something that I try to. I, I lie to people and say I don't do. Yeah, we all lie about it. Everyone likes the way it feels to see people interacting with something you post. And everyone hates the way it feels to see nobody doing it. Yeah, right. And so I was like, I'm going to delete this shit. And then I like, I truly did like get high on an edible, but like that I'd taken before, fell asleep, woke up the next morning and the song had like done a lot of, uh, a lot of numbers on on TikTok for my, like at my following at that point. Like it was blowing up thousands of comments, hundreds of thousands of likes. I was like, oh, cool. And, And then I wrote the chorus, uh, that next morning, kind of with that like pep in my step, of like, cool, people like it. Here's a chorus, you know, and um, yeah, posted it, posted it, and that did well as well. That's so different than like the story that movies, like The Rocker or whatever, or, like not The Rocker, but like the story yeah. that movies tell us about how songs are created. You know, I love that idea that you you wrote the verse, got a little too high, <laughs> fell asleep, which we all do. Yeah. Um, you wake up and, but what a beautiful thing to know that like, oh, hey, I never, cause I'm, I'm hard on TikTok. I'm hard on TikTok and music cause I'm 36 and yeah. I'm just outside of it. For sure. Yeah. And yeah. I'm hard on it and I'm trying not to be hard on it. No, it's good to be critical sometimes. I know, but it, sometimes it, it veers into old grump or like, yeah, or old s- man yells at cloud. Kind yeah. Of. Or maybe like some self-criticism on my part. Like I don't really get it. So I'm, you know, yeah, so, you yeah. feel like outside of it. Yeah. So it's like everything about it has to suck. Yeah, exactly. I, I get know. that. Yeah. I do the same thing. And I'm like, but I had all my success on this app. Like, yeah. why am I making fun of everybody? <laughs> like, what am I doing? What I like about it is that you get this moment where you go, oh my God, that verse really works. Now I can write a chorus. Totally. Yeah, totally. And like, what was cool, and like I genuinely mean this, like, of course, a lot of this song was driven by like the fact that people liked it already. But I think I needed to hear that. I was so low confidence in my songwriting. And like beyond the point of being critical or being like constructively critical, I was like, everything sucks. And like it felt really good to write something that felt like a little different from what I was making. It was about Vermont, which is like I didn't think people were going to relate to. It was really just for me. And to see all these people be like, hey, I love this idea. I'm like, cool. Like there's a lane for this feeling that I have in my songwriting right now, which is like I can write about what I care about at home by myself, not needing to be in a, in a multi-million dollar studio or with a big time producer. Like people want to hear what I have to say. Um, and that felt really cool. Like to get that validation. I really needed that at that time. Isn't there a lesson there? Like this, this gets bigger than any of that other stuff you'd done. Yeah, there is a lesson. And I just talked to somebody last night about it. I was like, man, like I got to make my next record now. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And it's like, well, last time, didn't you just like do whatever the fuck you wanted? And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll try to do that again. Why? Don't we? Like, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about in, I'll just be candid with you. First two or three years of this show, I mean, I was, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't sound like this. Yeah. I kind of sounded like this guy. I was talking a lot about this. And Noah Khan, mm-hmm. thank you so much for being mm-hmm. here. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, the show, I mean, I don't want to discount the work of the people who work on the show who did amazingly hard work. Totally. I wasn't that pleased with it. And I don't want to listen to it now. Yeah. And it and it didn't it wasn't doing great it was doing okay mm-hmm. it was keeping the lights on sure and then one day I was just like fuck it I'm just gonna be my I'm gonna start to sound like a human yeah try to sound <laughs> like me and things started doing all right a little bit question I've been wondering and I think you might have been thinking about this too why don't we just do it at the beginning oh I don't know that's a great question and I'm glad that you found uh you found your voice and I'm happy for you that you, you're hopefully you're doing what you want to do now yeah. I think it's hard because sometimes when you have the success doing the thing you want to do, everything that comes from that success pulls you farther away from that, which is so interesting. It's like the reason that I got here was because I did whatever I wanted to do. And the reason that I can't do that again is because I'm touring or because I'm doing press and, you know, you're making some money. And like, it feels like the world does try to keep you away from yourself in a lot of ways. And like the symptom of success and of like finding value and being yourself uh is sometimes that it brings in new elements that take you away from that like endeavor which i find to be really like oxymoronic and just kind of like ironic and if i, if I can put a point on it like for people who don't know like the, a lot of this record was was written in vermont right like at home yeah. in vermont and you're like your folks were going through a divorce and mm-hmm. you were you know you were home 
I love the story about you wearing like your high school soccer outfit. You yeah. know what I mean? And you were <laughs> yeah. feeling like you were regressing a little bit. Yeah. And then, right? Yeah, totally. Totally. I was, I was kind of like, like, like luck, or I guess it wasn't luck because it was COVID. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like this really random event forced me back. <coughs> all right. Forced me back right. into like this innocence, I guess, that I had lost in the music industry. Like, I was forced back home by the pandemic, you know, I was forced to, to reckon with like my parents' relationship again, mm. with my relationship with my siblings, mm. with my relationship with my old friends who were all coming back home. Mm. I was back in my hometown. It was like, I just was kind of transported back in time. And I think like what I had was like this new songwriting skill that I'd garnered for years in the music industry and like a live per- performance background and like a decent sized fan base. But I was back to where I started emotionally and like that let me kind of access that like inner child that like just let's just do this because it's fun. Yeah. With the tools of like a you know, seasoned music industry person. And, that's a good uh, that's a good point. It's yeah. not like you didn't it's not like you were I'm gonna go back to the way I used to write. So you had learned a lot of skills and a lot of like Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of I had a lot of tools at my disposal. Um and I was fortunate because like, you know, for a lot of artists the pan- the pandemic like just cut them off right at the beginning. And like I had already had a, a few tours. I was just dissatisfied with my life and my career and uh what I needed was this big change and I needed to feel like it wasn't so fucking serious. Like, you know, to me it was like the world is ending. Like I might never tour again. Like this competitiveness in me to like be touring and to like be doing bigger and bigger and better, like kind of went away with when it went away for everybody else. And I felt like it was like an even playing field a little bit. Um, and it just felt really good to be making music that like I liked and not thinking about how it was going to propel me forward. I never thought about that when I was making these songs. I was never like, this is going to be the thing. I never thought about it like that. And now I hear what you're saying because now you're... And now it's like, we're right back. Like I feel like I'm right back to where I was before the pandemic. And it's... So what are you going to do? Is that a dirt? Oh God, I need is, another pen. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I, if you could just isolate that and turn it into a tick, that would help me out a lot. Yeah, that would ruin that. my career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think I need to find what like what worked from that and find a way to bring it into my life. And that's going to require more discipline than I was able to have at that time. Like that's going to require me making the changes and not oh, yeah. the government deciding that everything's closed down or like, you know, that's not going to be like a best health practice. It's going to be a Noah, like turn off your phone, go yeah. home, unplug. You've learned what worked. Yeah, I, I have. And I have yeah. no excuse not to yeah. at least try it again. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you about, uh, can I ask you about growing sideways? Yeah, of course. Can we take a listen to it? So I forgot my medication, fell into a manic high. Spent my savings at a Lulu. Now I'm suffering in style. I just pain so impatient. Pain like it's got That's a place. Noah Khan with Growing Sideways from his album Stick Season. Um, a couple of things on that. One is I heard you do an introduction of it, and you said, uh, I've been thinking about all the years I spent lying to therapists, mm-hmm. which I've also done. <laughs> I don't know why I've done it, and I don't. I stop myself immediately and go, I don't know why I'm about to lie to you. And then, then like, you're like, fuck, now I need to talk about that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, why no, am I lying? No, yeah, now, now we're not going to get to the thing to the next session. Yeah, hey, by the way, should I not be swearing? Ah, whatever. Okay, cool. Sorry. I'll try to say I think I think the rule at the CBC is three nights at Scotiabank, you can swear in the CBC. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Listen, if it was two nights, yeah, two you'd, ni- be, you'd be bleeped, buddy. <laughs> two nights, you you're kicked out of Canada. Three <laughs> yeah, nights, do whatever yeah, you want. Yeah, yeah. One night, you got to host this show. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a, an, um, and it, okay, going back to the authenticity thing uh, we were talking about earlier, there's a line there that says, I'm terrified that I might have never met me, which mm-hmm. tells me that there's a, there's another self that you were talking about that maybe wasn't. Yeah. So let's, let's Mr. Brightside that one too. When and where did you write that one? Yeah, I was in Boston um, and I was just spending the day like trying to write a song. This one wasn't like I want to post a TikTok. I was like, I just want to write a song today and I want to keep it like, a little lighter. I think I was going for like um, these very like, I was trying to be like super deep and like introspective and like smart sounding. And and then I just started thinking like, all right, I I just gotten off um, Zoloft for the first time. I've been taking it for a while and it really yeah. helped me. Like, yeah. But I felt like it was kind of um, doing my uh, creativity a little bit. Like I feel like that's my, my my like fundamental struggle with antidepressants, which I like think I need for my brain, um, is that 
a lot of times I feel like the battle is like trying to be creative versus being happy versus, you know, yeah. would I rather be happy and like a little numb or like really depressed and creative, but like not happy at all. Yeah. And so I was just thinking about that. And then I started thinking about um, my experience in therapy. Like I was very privileged growing up. I grew up in a nice area with a family of, of who were able to afford to send me to therapy when I was eight or nine. Um, and I just couldn't like, something in me like couldn't be honest with like the guy in there for a long time because I couldn't be honest with myself. And so it was even harder for me to articulate it. Um, and you can kind of just cheat your way through it. Like if you just like say smart sounding things or like understand the idea of your emotions enough yeah. to like talk about them in a way that feels like articulate. You, and, can, like, you can convince them and you that you're going, you can, Fool yourself into thinking or convincing them into, yeah. that, that you had a breakthrough. Right. And yeah. it's, it's all, it's like, it's like, and it's inherently manipulative, you know, for yourself and for that person. Yeah. Um, but I was just clock watching every time. Like, how do I get out of here and seem like I'm making progress? Um, and uh, yeah, for a long time, I just did that. And I would leave being like, well, I went to therapy, so I'm doing better, you know? Yeah. And the truth is, like, I was going to therapy, but I wasn't in therapy. I was just putting on a performance. Yeah. Um and I did that for a long time. And uh, and so I was writing about kind of that feeling of like, maybe I have don't have any idea who I am because I've just been dancing around it for so many years. Um, and I used to be like, man, oh, I'm a songwriter. Like I'm deep and smart and thoughtful. And like, there's no way that I don't know anything about myself. And I was like, wait, but a lot of these songs like are kind of like they were, I was scared that they were kind of like being in therapy. Like I was just like, oh, like I was yeah, just like yeah, yeah, yeah. getting to the surface of an emotion and then like talking about it as if I was like had dealt with it and understood it really well or like was am I just really good at like therapy speak and therapy jargon and like and it scared the shit out of me that I like could be sending like a false message out and I think that might be like a deep fear and I think that when I wrote those songs there was a lot of that real feeling in there yeah but it, it, when I was writing Growing Sideways that was like a, a fundamental fear of mine was that I had like just drifted through life without any idea of who I actually was or what I was actually feeling. And, and, uh, and that scared me. Uh, and I also like the second verse, you know, felt, took, stopped taking my medication, like went and spent all my money. Like I, I, from a real experience I had when I first went on Prozac and I, uh, went cold Turkey off of it. Which, oh no. Which you're really not supposed to do. It's, hard on, it's really yeah. hard on you. Really hard. I mean, I like walked the streets of Los Angeles and got this like horrible haircut that I thought looked really cool, and I was, like, super manic and, like, uh, spent a bunch of money on, I don't know if it was Lulu, but I spent a bunch of money on, like, terrible clothing, and I was just walking, like, just like a crazy person walking around because <laughs> right. I was, like, literally having, like, crazy withdrawals. Uh, and so I figured I'd throw that into the song because I thought it was a funny memory, and I wanted to shout out Lululemon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of where that song came from. <laughs> You're going to get a brand deal out of it, maybe yeah, try to have it. Yeah. But it's okay. <laughs> yeah, come on, we make it happen. Uh, what I love, I tell you what I love, I appreciate you telling me all that stuff. Yeah. Um, what I love about it is well, a bunch of stuff. I like the song. And also, I saw, um, when, I, when I saw a couple of live performances of it, your crowd, who are like, you know, your age or so, like, there's like 10 years in the difference between you and me. It's not a whole lot, but mm -hmm. it's enough that, like, we weren't as open about it. Yeah. I watched a Cheers episode the other day where, like, one of the people, like, a rumor got out that one of the people was going to a therapist. And everyone was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Throw him in the woods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, oh, no. I'm so then, worried about him. He's going to a therapist. But turns out it was false. And he had to convince everybody. Like, no, I'm not. You know, it turns out he's not. And the resolution cool. of the episode was, okay, good. He's not. <laughs> Dude. That's so, that's so crazy, man. <laughs> and, and I think even for me, especially as a guy, like in, in when I was in – I started going when I was 28. What was that? It was like seven years ago, eight years ago. I didn't know a whole lot of people. Yeah. And I didn't, I wasn't, and before that, I probably should have gone years before that. And I didn't think it was okay to go. And I had, had a panic attack and I didn't know what it was because no one told me. Right. And I didn't think it was all right. And none of my friends thought it was all right. Yeah. It's amazing to see at your shows when you're singing about this stuff, when you say the word like, so I went to see my therapist and a crowd of 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds flips out. Yeah. And it's it, crazy. It, but in addition to it being wild, it also just means that like, it's okay to to have those experiences now. Were you like like when you were going when you were eight? Were you was it okay? Did you feel like okay, yeah, I can do this? I think since I didn't know anybody else that was going, and like 
I didn't understand why I was there. Yeah. Like I remember being like, why am I here in hindsight? I'm like, oh my God, of course I should have been in therapy all day long. Yeah. Like seven days a week. But, yeah. I, <laughs> but um, I didn't know why I was there. And so I felt like to me, it was like this, it felt like more work to me. Like it didn't feel like something that I was like blessed to be able to do. I was like, what is this weird thing I have to go do every week? Like, okay. Um, there was no shame or stigma around there it. There was right? no shame or stigma around okay. it. No, because my siblings went and I, um, and my parents always supported the idea of like going to talk to somebody about something. And I truly in my head thought that everyone else in my class was having the same experience that everyone's parents talked to them about that. Like that everyone was like, everybody was like, was, fluent in the language of like therapy and like talking about your feelings. Mm. Um, it wasn't until later on in life that I realized how fortunate I was for that and how rare that was. Is um, that, is that why busy head exists? Yeah, it does. And it also exists for the reason of growing, of growing sideways. Um, like I said, I spend a lot of time writing about mental health in my songs and like writing about my anxiety and my fear and depression. And like, that is awesome. I think like, it's cool that I'm able to, that I do that, whatever. Um, but like, Putting your money where your mouth is kind of is, yeah. is the reason busy head, busy head exists. Like, I'm playing arenas now. Um, like, that comes with, like, money and um, opportunity that I didn't have before. Um, and I would be a waste to not use that platform, that resource for, like, something really good um, that actually does the work. Like, not just singing about it, but actually, like, raising money for organizations. Like, last night, Jack.org came to... The show, and they are, you know, going to schools and teaching kids about mental health and like making a real difference in like communities across Canada. Um, and the way they were talking about it, like speaking of like to your point about my shows about growing sideways, was like people are kids are so much more fluent in this stuff now yeah. because of organizations like that. People are able to like talk about it with their friends, and yeah. like it's not like this terrible thing that you would never talk about, or else some guy would call you a baby or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's something that's really starting to happen. And like, for me, like being able to support that, like, and give the kid, give people an opportunity that you might not have had like, yeah. to not feel ashamed or to feel weird about or to have a panic attack before you go to therapy. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that I can do um, and that I can help make happen. And like, you know, I'm playing for two, no, three nights at Scotiabank. I don't know how many people are. It was like a, 60, 60,000 people. 60,000 people Over are three nights. hopefully going to leave feeling like they can talk about yeah. uh, mental health because I did. Hopefully that's the goal. Um, and so and, it's an opportunity. And then the next step is just making sure everyone can get access to it. Because I know you've said that before. Like you said, the, you said to me just then, you were like, I was lucky enough to have access to resources. Mm -hmm. And I often, I always want to, whenever I talk about mental health in the show, I always want to say I get insurance through my, my work, yeah. which allowed me to have a subsidized and accessible therapist. Yeah. And I just want more people to have that access, you know? Totally. Like something I wanted to talk about and not to just sit here and get on my soapbox or juice box or whatever the hell the word is uh i think it's juice box juice bo not to yeah. get them on my juice box <laughs> uh and like kind of like pat myself in the back but like something that we we started on this tour was we have this company backline that uh provides links people on in the touring industry with um with therapists and counselors and oh like, lovely I think it's something that's really, I really hope that other artists start to do because like there's a blueprint for it now. And like you said, like getting mental health accessed through your work is like a really, really cool thing. Um, and just finding ways to get people access to this care. Um, because even, you know, for me, even with the money that my parents were able to spend on sending me to therapy, like there was only six or seven therapists in the area. And yeah. Almost all of them knew my family, yeah, knew right. me. I was friends, dads yeah. or whatever. And like that. It's really hard. Like getting people access to good, like equitable health, like mental health care in the states. And I can't speak to Canadian healthcare system, but in the states, we really desperately need that. And yeah. uh, that's something I'm really, really passionate about, and I want to get more involved in somehow. Here in Canada too, how's the how's the fame part of that? F fame is unmooring. Yeah, and can mess with you. Yeah. Um, how's, can I ask how that, how that, that of part Of course, is? Yeah. yeah. I tried, sometimes I feel like I spent so much time being like, I'm not actually, like no one cares or like whatever, like I'm not famous or like I don't like to think of myself like that. Yeah, of course. Like, and I hate to admit that like there is like a tension on me that I didn't have before. Yeah. But there is and like, it's like I'm already super paranoid. <laughs> like I, I'm paranoid and I'm a weed smoker. 
already. <laughs> so I'm always like, oh, that guy's watching me. But now they sometimes they are really watching me. <laughs> that's really hard. Like, when your weed paranoids come you, to life. You like, yeah. walk through a hotel lobby, and you're like, why is everyone looking at me? Oh, and the cops right. are coming. And yeah. like, oh, no, they all are looking at you. Um, sometimes it's hard, you know? Like, I, I, I think it's just a matter of, like, feeling like I can't... Uh, like, I can't be alone, especially when I'm on tour. I'm, like, in a city where I'm about to play. That's, you know, when I'm back home, like, very rarely will people talk to me or notice me or whatever. But when, nice. I'm, when I'm on tour and I'm, like, in the city around the venue, like, I just feel like I can't relax, you know? Like, and I'm trying not to do anything that could be considered, like, socially unacceptable at all. Like, jaywalk. Can't, I can't fucking jaywalk anymore, dude. I love jaywalking. I absolutely love the jaywalking. I saw that in your Wikipedia article. Yeah, yeah jaywalking enthusiasts. The rush, dude. <laughs> the rush of, like, walking when you're not supposed to oh, walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's... Look, like, there are a lot of worse things in life than to, to worry about than somebody coming to ask you for a photo. Yeah, of and course. It, and it means the world when people notice me, and my fans are so sweet and so respectful. Um, I occasionally feel bad for friends, family, uh, being with me that are, like, kind of, like, forced to have a photo taken of them or like they'll yeah. see themselves on TikTok or whatever. And like that is, can be a little unfair, I think like they yeah. didn't ask for that. And so, um, you know, it's just part of the, part of the territory, man. Like you're playing arenas. I chose to be here. Like that's a lot of people and they're going to notice you and they want to say hi to you. And, and as long as it's done in a safe and respectful way, like I'm all for it. Um, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the, for the exposure I've had, but of course it's uncomfortable sometimes, but man, any job has its, as it's, pitfalls get over it i saw the I, I don't know if you saw it on my page just saying I, I saw that photo of you at the olivia rodrigo show with the <laughs> with the wig i got it here you want to see it <laughs> dude like i honestly think i look beautiful i said i think that, you look great like with the darkness of my eyebrows and the hair color like i do think i resemble a jennifer aniston archetype yeah i can see that and you're wearing a mask I'm wearing a mask. So the beard's covered? So the beard is covered. And you're at an Olivia Rodrigo show because <laughs> you're going to sing with her, right? I was about to go on stage with her, and my uh, my friends and family were there. And so I was like, I want to go see them, and I want to watch the show. And so I threw my yeah, I threw my wig on. Uh, her manager actually got me the wig. She's like, I want you to watch the show. And so I was wearing the wig, and I was walking around out there, and nobody noticed at all. What was that like? It was awesome, dude. Like I'm usually like used to like being at like a show where I'm about to go on stage. People will be like, "Oh, you're about to, he's about to go on stage. Let's take some photos." No one cared. No one noticed. I was able to like dance and like sing and like it was the first time that I felt like I could be myself in public, like in a in a setting where I knew I'd be photographed typically. Uh, and it was awesome. Like it was so freeing. Like I was just I'm literally just dancing. I know all of Olivia's songs. I was just dancing and singing and. And I didn't think anyone was going to find out, which is why you have me in this photo of me shushing the camera. Uh, but I, <laughs> my favorite part is later on Twitter, like, somebody thought that I was Sabrina Carpenter. Oh, really? <laughs> like the pop star Sabrina <laughs> so, like, Carpenter? I, there was a lot of security around uh. her, and she was in a VIP <laughs> area. I was like, no, that was me and my security guard <laughs> watching Olivia. That must have been nice to be able to be yourself at a big show, uh, you know? That's nice. It was so cool. And also, like, it was cool to have little super long hair, and I was, like, bouncing it around to, to all of her songs. And it was cool to be a... To be like in an environment where it's not at all about me, like at all. Yeah. It was like all about Olivia and all about the fans experiencing it. And I was like, it was cool to be like among the lines of that for a second at a show. It was awesome. She's good. She's amazing, man. You guys got a, a, like a friendship. You guys, you guys yeah. have a mutual respect for one another. I can tell. I think she's a really, really good person. Yeah, I think she's a great songwriter. She's a great songwriter. She's super talented. She's an amazing performer. And she's as nice as you like would want her to be. Oh, that's nice. And like you see her on stage and then you're like my god she's like a superstar and then like i you meet her backstage and she's like a really nice 21 year old kid that's like living her dream doing it the right way keeping good people around her um i'm inspired by her like i have a lot to learn from her the way she writes uh the way she carries herself like i'm always inspired and impressed by particularly like young women pop stars that are able to like take all this fame the negative from like weirdos on the internet and like people attacking them, um, but also being able to like take it all in stride to make great music that they care about um, and to set an example for younger artists. I, I just, I think it's really impressive. Like having my little taste of like doing arenas and like having people bothering me sometimes, like at the level that Olivia is experiencing that kind of lifestyle, like for her to be so grounded and for her to be so mature and so like um, kind and sweet still with everybody, like 
it's a it's a indicative of a really good personality and a really good person. So I think she's dope. The, the great ones are, man. The great ones are nice. Totally, totally. I always say like this year I've gotten to meet some like huge famous people. Yeah. And like the people that are the kindest are those people yeah. because they know who they are and yeah. it's gotten them success and they yeah. don't need to change that for anybody. I think yeah. it's the people that you meet that can be prickly are the people that are still finding that out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, Bruce, I always say Bruce Springsteen was 15 minutes early and friendly. It's crazy. How have you changed or not changed since this album came out? I've been very excited and proud of myself for remaining grateful for all of it. I feel like I don't at any point expect any level of anything. Um, I, I don't expect a great crowd every night, even though all my crowds are great, but I don't expect the craziest crowd in the world. I don't expect every song to go to number one. Um, and I still feel grateful for every opportunity I do get. I think I have been, I, th- I think I've changed my standards for songwriting. Like, <laughs> I think I sit down, I'm like, oh, dude, like, I love this last album I made. I think those songs are really good. I still think that I should be able to sit down and write a great song every single time. Right and that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, that's not how it works in any creative endeavor. Yeah. Like, it's not how it works most of the time. Yeah, very rarely. And so I'm trying to, I think I've lost a little bit of that patience and a little bit of that groundedness in my songwriting. And I'm desperately trying to find that again, just like remembering that I'm human and that it's not like, it's, it doesn't work like you sit down and you write gold every time. Um, I think seeing people sing the words every night and feeling like this record has really changed some people's you know, lives, I think, in my life. Um, has created this idea that like everything I need to do needs to be like some groundbreaking thing, and uh, that's just not how how it's gonna work. So, I'm trying to stay. Uh, I'm trying to find my way back to uh, a little bit more of a humble mindset around my songwriting, and that's something that I, I really want to strive to endeavor, or sorry, strive to accomplish this year. Man, it's 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 quite a story, Thank um, you. but all sort of uh, uh, held down. Everything you've told me of all this instability has been really held down by just undeniably great songs. Thank you, man. I appreciate you coming in. Yeah, I appreciate your questions. Thanks a lot. (laughs) 